I've already mentioned that I think The Wasteland is a poem that you can't read the way you read other poems, by which I mean you can't read it beginning to end as some sort of linear, unbroken narrative. It just doesn't work that way. One of Eliot's most common techniques, and we see this in both Proofrock and The Wasteland, is to construct his poem out of sort of fragmented images that make more of a sort of slideshow, I guess, of a poem than a movie of a poem, if you follow that analogy. Eliot actually talks a little bit about this in the poem itself um, when he says at the beginning of the second stanza, What are the roots that clutch? What branches grow out of this stony rubbish? Son of man, you cannot say or guess, for you know only a heap of broken images. In other words, he's, he's saying there that we can't understand sort of overall structure of things because all we can see are these little broken pieces. Now, I think he's actually talking about society and some other issues going on at the time in those lines, but the lines apply pretty well to the poem itself. In other words, it's hard to talk about the roots of this poem or the branches that grow out of it, by which I mean the structure of it and how it sort of works together as a unified whole, because I don't think it does work together as a unified whole. It works together as a series of broken images that taken together sort of add up to an overall picture of things, um, even though individually they might not make a lot of sense, at least on first reading. So my advice is to not even try to swallow the poem whole, you know, read it start to finish, and think about it as one thing. Instead, I think it makes a lot more sense, it's a lot more productive, to look at just little pieces, whether that's stanzas or sections, or sometimes even just a part of a stanza. Um, I think, for example, that we might be able to uh, make some meaning out of the first few lines of this poem. And these first few lines are... are pretty famous lines. In fact, that the opening line of the poem is one of the most famous opening lines in all of English literature. Um, but if we look at just those first four lines, maybe, of the poem and try to understand what Eliot's doing in those lines, in some ways that offers us sort of a key to unlocking other pieces of the poem. I'm not saying that if we understand these four lines, everything else makes sense, but at least we can see um, how we're supposed to be thinking about the poem overall and how we're supposed to be reading it. So the poem opens after um, the uh, invocation to Ezra Pound. Um, it opens with these lines. April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Now, if we're not really paying attention to those lines, they may just sort of wash over us without us thinking much about them. But when we look at those lines, there's a lot of weird stuff going on in those lines. Um, if we just start with that first phrase, April is the cruelest month, that's a really surprising statement uh, for a poem to start with. First of all, April is not generally considered a cruel month. It's usually one of the mildest, most pleasant, most enjoyable months of the year both meteorologically and, for lack of a better term, culturally. Um, April is the beginning of spring. Spring is a time of rebirth and growth and renewal. Um, April is most closely related with the holiday of Easter. I mean, Easter can technically uh, occur in March as well, um, but it's usually in April, about 75% of the time anyway. And so we think of April as being connected in some way to Easter, at least in the, in the Christian, Judeo-Christian world. Um, and Easter is a holiday about resurrection and rebirth and, and I guess about hope in general. And April in poetry is often uh, portrayed in this very positive, hopeful way as well. Um, many critics have pointed out that Eliot is probably sort of responding here to the opening of the Canterbury Tales by Geoffrey Chaucer. Um, which starts, again, with an invocation of April. Um, in Middle English, it's, it's pronounced very differently, but basically the first few lines of the Canterbury Tales are when that April with its sweet showers has pierced the drought of March. And Chaucer goes on to say this time when um, plants are growing and birds are singing is also a time when people are coming together. Um, and the Canterbury Tales are coming together to go on pilgrimages. Now, Eliot, as we've already seen, and as we'll continue to see, is a very... Um, elusive poet, by which I mean he makes a lot of allusions to other works of literature. 
Um, and The Wasteland, I think, is probably the most elusive poem ever written. Uh, so it's it's likely that Eliot's aware of this um, allusion here. In other words, that he's consciously sort of referring to Chaucer's famous opening. And so to start off by saying April is the cruelest month, I think right away Eliot is sort of announcing his intentions to disrupt the normal way we think about things. And modernism is very interested in this idea of disruption, of breaking up our sort of um, comfortable ways of looking at the world, about uh, looking at society, looking at reality, um, what modern art is all about. And by modern here, I, as I said in an earlier lecture, I'm really talking about like Picasso and Matisse and early 20th century art, not contemporary early 21st century art. But those artists were largely interested in disrupting and making things different and breaking up the way we think about art, for example. So Eliot's doing something similar here by starting with this idea that April is cruel. But I don't think it's just disruption. I think he's also making a larger point um, that's going to resonate throughout the poem. It's going to be really important to understanding what he's saying in this poem overall. So we need to understand, I guess, why is April the cruelest month? And we might have some guesses, uh, since the poem is called The Wasteland, which is a term that literally means a land where nothing grows. Maybe he's saying that April is cruel because we expect things to grow, but things aren't growing. But I don't think that's exactly right either. I mean, if we look at the very next phrase, April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land. In other words, tells us things are growing. So now that's even more confusing, right? If the, the things are growing, first of all, why is it why is April cruel, but also why is it considered a wasteland? And I think that points us towards the idea that he's not talking literally about the land. He's not talking about actual growth of vegetation, which is what we usually uh, talk about when we refer to something as a wasteland. I think he's talking about something else, something, I don't know, social, cultural, spiritual waste is what he's really referring to. Um, and so I think if we look at those lines again, when he says April is the cruelest month, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire. In other words, I think he's saying April is cruel because things are growing. In other words, because it's spring, because the flowers are blooming and the birds are singing, and that because of that, we remember that in the past, we've had maybe some kind of cultural or spiritual regeneration at the same time. In other words, nature is reminding us of the lack of regeneration, rebirth, renewal, etc., going on in our lives, in our society, etc. Now, as we've already talked about, The Wasteland is a poem largely about World War I, or rather about what the world had become after World War I. And I think this is Eliot's main complaint, is that um, there's a sense of death, of waste in the society overall. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what kinds of waste and what kinds of death he's referring to, but, but it's not a literal death. He's not just referring to dead people or to the fact that, that um, because it's April, plants aren't growing, but rather because the, the lilacs are blooming, because they're coming out of that dead land, the land that we live in, the land of our society, in other words, that they're making us think that it's spring, that everything's going to be okay. And just like when you have that first sunny day after a long period of rain or the first day of spring after a long, hard winter, and you think, okay, now we're on the other side. Now things are going to be okay. But Eliot's point is that that's not happening, at least not happening socially, not happening, happening culturally. And so April is just a reminder of the fact that that's not happening. And that helps us understand why a few lines later he says, winter kept us warm, covering, covering earth in forgetful snow. Now, winter keeping us warm, again, is an example of disruption, of saying the opposite of what we expect. But I think what he's saying there is that when the land was covered up with snow, um, we could forget that while the land survives, our culture, our society is still suffering. Um, in other words, we, we felt sort of kinship with the land. But now that the snow's melted and we're seeing the, the lilacs bloom again, it's just a reminder 
that while the natural world may be seeing some rebirth, some resurrection, we're not seeing that socially. We're not seeing it culturally. You'll notice there's a lot of imagery of drought and dryness in this poem, as you would expect from a poem called The Wasteland. And it shows up throughout uh, a lot of references to dust and to um, a lack of water, uh, to thirst. Um, there's a sort of famous passage later in the poem where he says, If there were water and no rock, if there were rock and also water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, if there were the sound of water only, not the cicada and dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop, drip, drop, 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 but there is no water. So again, because we know from the beginning of the poem that lilacs are blooming, obviously there must be rain. Uh, so he's not talking about a literal physical drought. I think instead he must be talking about a spiritual drought. I think what he's saying is that society, especially in the wake of World War I, and I don't want you to forget that idea that this poem is largely about what happened to society after World War I. This society is thirsty uh, for some kind of, I don't know, probably spiritual meaning uh, in life, and they're not getting it. Um, there's, there's no water. There's just rock. That What Eliot's really talking about is a sort of disintegration of um, the social fabric and the things that we used to be able to count on as being meaningful. Those things aren't there anymore. And as a result, and I've made this point other places, this poem is largely about sort of chaos, a lack of meaning, a lack of structure. It's right back to uh, that line from Yeats' The Second Coming, things fall apart, the center cannot hold, and mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. We probably see that in the poem no place better than the very end of the poem. And there's a lot going on in the last section of the poem, and I would encourage you to read that section really carefully. But the last stanza is a, a sort of picture of a poem falling apart, of breaking up into little pieces. Those last few lines, um, starting with the, the image of the fisherman on the shore with the arid plain behind him, and that question, shall I at least set my lands in order? Can I do something to um, make things you know, move in the right direction, to start building a foundation for... Uh, what we're missing in society now. But right after that, we have London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. We have these lines of first uh, Italian and then uh, French, and I won't uh, try to read those to you. And then those last few lines, these fragments I have shored against my ruins, uh, which seems to offer us a little bit of hope that maybe the fragments can be used as sort of pieces to prop up something uh, to lead us forward in society. Then we have a few lines of sort of craziness again. Um, these are, are lines from a, a 17th century play. Uh, Why then I'll fit you Hieronymo's mat again. Then we go back to the Sanskrit that we've been uh, seeing earlier in this section of the poem, data dayadvam damyata, the words that the thunder said, the words that the Buddha talks about in the fire sermon. If you don't know what I'm talking about, make sure you're reading the footnotes to the poem. And then those last three words, shanti, 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 uh, and that word, the footnote will tell you again, means something like the peace which path, passeth understanding. In other words, a, a peace that we, we can't even think about, that it's so um, powerful. So what does that all mean? Well, I, mean, I think that all, uh, Eliot is offering us little sort of glimpses of hope, glimpses of order, glimpses of structure, but in between those glimpses is nothing more than just sort of pure chaos and a poem in crisis that's meant to mirror, I think, a society in crisis. Um, I know that that doesn't give you a very good sort of hold on the poem overall. And as I told you, I, I, I don't think you're going to get to the point where this poem really just makes sense in the way that other poems do. But maybe 
I'm taking some of these techniques I've been showing you here, looking at individual parts of the poem, looking at individual images. Go through the poem and see the different places uh, that, that Eliot's using images of uh, dryness, as I've talked about already, um, for example. Um, look at the way the poem deals with sex. Uh, one of the things that the Elvitz is very interested in, I think, in this poem is the idea that sex has become meaningless in the society as well, that, that it's sort of sex without procreation, without regeneration, in other words, um, that's just sex for personal gratification. I don't think that's the only thing the poem's about by any means, but there's uh, certainly references to that in the poem. So that's a lot, I know. But I think that Eliot wants this poem to be a lot. So I'm going to encourage you to spend a little more time with this poem, with this really difficult, really fascinating poem. Um, if, in your, when you're reading it, you have other questions, and I'm pretty sure you will have some questions. First of all, I encourage you to post them on the forums. I'd really like to see some discussion of some of the difficult parts of this poem. But also you can uh, ask me individually. You can send me an email or whatever. I'm happy to try to answer your questions. Uh, don't, you know, uh, hold out too much hope, though I'm not going to be able to explain everything in this poem to you, mostly because I don't understand everything in this poem myself. Um, but I'm more than happy to talk to you about it. So let me know what questions you have. Thank you.